This is the Friday, April 21, 2023 installment of Market Plus. Joining us again is Sean Hackett. Sean, I have to just quickly, we're going to talk about cattle on feed in a moment, but I had an interview this week for the podcast and we were talking about cattle and they watch and I said they need more cows on the show. So here's your cow on the show uh, right there. So I've done what I need to do. <laughs> Sean. Yes. Cattle on feed. Yes. You were surprised by what happened. Why? Well, we just haven't seen a bearish report in a while, and, and the uh, cattle on-feed number was 1% above, which in itself is not that much of a miss, but the placements were almost 4% above what the expectations were while the markings were about the same. And so that's the first time we've seen a number that just really didn't add up to the bull's case. And when you're trading near all-time highs and you have speculators really long, you know, they're just they're just – looking for a reason to sell the market. This might just be what triggers a potential waterfall event in the short run, in the short run. Okay, so that leads perfectly into our first question then. Uh, James in the frozen north asked us on Twitter, how long do the cattle prices hold up then? Well, I, I don't think they're going to hold up at all. As we said in the main show, we've broken above that all-time high in the August cattle, and we're stalled out, and we're not showing any momentum. And, and markets just don't do that. They either keep going or they fall back down. But why is it that, say, the stock market, we have all these bad economic news pieces, and you think that that's the final nail that's going to send us lower, and it doesn't. Can the same resilience happen in commodities? The answer is no. We haven't seen that resiliency. We've seen speculators unleash on crude oil, unleash on the wheat market, unleash on the cotton market. They've not shown resiliency like they do in the stock market. We said, in, you know, commodities have to live in the real world of actual supply and demand. Stocks can say, oh, yeah, demand's going to be better three years from now. We don't have that luxury in cotton. We've got to move the product today. And I think that's one of the reasons that we don't get away with being able to look past a lot of this negative economic news, you know, as the stock market can. So you're saying commodities are more impacted by the negative economic news than the stock market is? Yes. Am I hearing what you're saying? That is correct. Unless it's some kind of a financial crisis, then it's everything sells off. But we're not seeing a financial crisis. We're seeing a significant economic slowdown that the stock market so far has been willing to look beyond to when the Fed's going to reduce rates and when things are going to get better. And they can do that because we don't have physical supply and demand in IBM, for example, you know. All right. How about Phil in Dresden, Ontario? You always enjoy a good Phil question. <laughs> he wants to know, when will the spring rally in corn prices begin? Is it going to take a weather hiccup in the Brazil safrina crop and delayed U.S. corn planting, or does corn want to be like wheat? Well, I think what's really going to make the corn market turn around is, A, for, first of all, just getting too cheap. Um, we're getting there. But the secondly, we're going to need growing season weather problems. I do not believe planting ultimately is going to be that trigger. I think it's going to be drought coming back into the central eastern grain belt by June into July. That's what's going to be the weather event that turns around. Everyone right now, El Nino's coming. We're going to have perfect weather, record yields. Everybody's bearish. And our weather work is, does not agree with that assessment. And that would really, really take the market and zing it the other way if they've proven that that thesis is incorrect, and we think that it is. The last couple of weeks, our guests have been extremely bullish. One, not a surprise, one, a good surprise. You sometimes have more of a bullish sentiment. Are you only bullish that corn if it gets dry? Is there anything else you're bullish about right now, Sean? Well, we are bullish grain markets later in the year, as we mentioned in the show, because of the significant increase in feed demand as African swine fever requires and causes a change in the herd regrowth phase. So that's a demand side story later on in the year, but it's really not a factor during the growing season. The growing season can be driven by the safrina corn crop and by U.S. growing weather. We think the safrina corn crop is going to be fine, but we think much of that is getting priced in very, very quickly. But we don't think that the U.S. weather is going to be as you know, as perfect as the market is anticipating. In fact, we think it could be downright. The last time we had a transition from La Nina to El Nino with a negative PDO was 2012, and we're seeing a lot of similarities to the sea surface temperatures to suggest that might be something to be on the lookout for. I don't know the weather of 1952, but I do know the weather of 1983. Earlier in the broadcast, we talked about the snow in the Sierra Nevada, second biggest. Do you know what third biggest was? The snowfall of 1983. I don't know anything in between, but that may tend to, that's part of that negative PDO. 
We talked about A3 in our writings months ago about how this record snowfall led to one of the war top five worst grain crops in the summer of 1983. That this is this teleconnection, this pattern of a negative PDO led to that very, very poor growing season in the central eastern grain belt. Of course, we have blown that record off the water this time around, but it's a very similar mechanism of that negative PDO. And remember, we have not had the central eastern grain belt get into trouble since 2012. It's been a long time that we haven't had drought coming to the area. We are due, and the setup is there this year for it the way we see it. Yeah, this, the center east, uh, our friends in Ohio have just said, can we at least get a spring where we could plant something <laughs> on time? Right. Uh, Jake wants to know on Twitter, Sean, about the wheat market. Why does the wheat market want to remain irrational longer than I can remain solvent? We talked about it in the main show. I mean, so let's say KC wheat, right? That's the poster child for this. It's trading at a huge premium to international price. So think of it this way. You, how much of a differential can you, do you have to trade KC wheat to cut off demand when the rest of the world is undercutting you su substantially. We've already done it. We've already done what we need to do. We're already rationing demand based upon the weather because international prices are so depressed because Russia continues to undercut the market, at least up to this point. I wanted to ask this during the program, but I wanted to save it for plus. Uh, this is a question from Wes, and it, it seems to hold up. Why is Ukraine even relevant in today's market? You talked about Russia. But is Ukraine part of this relevant discussion? Well, they're relevant because they were, were a huge wheat exporter prior to the Ukraine war. Um, and having those supplies, let's say 30 to 50 percent of those supplies ultimately cut off in the long run is a huge issue. The issue is that it hasn't found itself to be an impact to the markets. Russia got kind of bailed out that story because they had this unbelievable huge crop, 105 million metric tons. It pretty much put 15 on that we took off, and it, but the, we're not going to keep getting that lucky. They're down to 85 this year, with Ukraine being down, let's say, 30 to 50 percent. The rubber is going to meet the road later this year, we think, and that's something to pay attention. Timing is everything, so I think that the wheat market is at a juncture where we've priced in as much of this oversupply as we can, and now we have to trade the other side of it. It has not gone away. It was just delayed, kind of kicking the can down the road by some fortuitous situations in the international marketplace. We open with livestock. We're going to close with livestock. Two questions. Yes. Uh, Justin in Michigan wants to know, have beef prices caused increased culling of the dairy herd, or do you anticipate it will meaningfully affect dairy production and the milk price? Out west, we are seeing heavy, heavy culling of cows because of the stress going on over there with the flooding and production is down 3% in California. So we're already seeing the culling of cows very, very strong. We're seeing the dairy herd starting to contract. And yes, it's going to lead to an overall contraction of U.S. supply later on in the year. If we can get Chinese demand back, remember, we've lost Chinese demand because of COVID, you know, this whole COVID chaos period that we're going through. But as they come out of it, we expect them to be a big buyer of dairy later in the year. The GDT auction results we just got at the last auction was one of the biggest increases we've seen in a long time. And that's where China shows their cards on the table for demand. So maybe we've already starting to see the early stages of turning the corner in the dairy parlor. I'll save my side comments about China and information for another time. Scotty in Iowa will release uh, this question to you, or he wants to know, at what price level of box beef will the consumer look to cheaper protein sources? Well, one would have thought they would have been doing it by now, yeah. considering how high it is. I mean, for those that know a lot more about consumer demand than I do, uh, suggest 300 might be the magical number. I've heard that talked about a lot. As we talked at the main show, I think we're very, very close to even beef demand getting impacted by what's going economically. I really feel that we're at that point where we're going to see that happen and have the market say, you know what, even though I prefer beef over pork or beef over chicken, I just can't afford to do this right now. I have to look for something different. I think we're really close to that. I and mean, it's going to happen very, very quickly when it does. How do you protect yourself then if you're one of those that have... Uh, both either an end user or uh, th the one supplying it. Well, I mean, certainly if you're, you know, if you're a cattle rancher, I mean, certainly we've been suggesting cash sales and protecting downside price risks right now going into the summer, given this risks. I mean, prices are fantastic. If you're someone that's saying, look, I have a budget. I need to look out for my family. You know, certainly looking at very, very economical pork prices and chicken prices relative to the beef prices, I certainly would be looking 
for value there. If I have a nice freezer, you know, put some, if you can afford it, put some in there because you're going to get a better chance buying some beef, I think, later on in the year and, and maximizing your dollar while your, the economy still remains under pressure. Sean, good to see you. Good to see you, Paul, as always. Thank you. Appreciate it. Sean Hackett, everyone. Next week, we are going to look at planting progress with a field report, and we'll also have the analysis from Don Rose. Thank you for joining us, and have a great week.